Hello, thank you, Jocelyn. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to come and uh, talk to you here. Uh, I'm going to provide a, a bit of an overview of, of uh, what's, what's happened uh, this year and, and look a bit back at the past as, as well as into the future. And uh, it, it's been a real challenge to you know, pick up what, what messages that I, I can try and encapsulate in, in, a, uh, in a presentation like this. And uh, you know, I could probably stand here and talk for a couple of days, but I'm sure that uh, there wouldn't be many people that would, other than my wife, of course, that would want to stay that long. <laughs> so um, just the most people probably are aware and, and uh, use the North Australia Fire Information website, hugely valuable source of, of information. And, uh, but probably not many of you sort of get to, to look at it in the big picture of, of what's happened this year in terms of, of all the patterning of fire that's, that's been in the landscape. You know, the, the, the bits in the, uh, all through the center here just swamp everything that's uh, you know, happened in, in the north, so color-coded uh, by month. So uh, in order to, to just sort of give a better perspective on that, um, you know, to, to zoom into the southern half of the territory, which is the, the area that we're uh, based in Alice and Tennant Creek from the bushfires NT's perspective or have responsibility for, and you know, the, the combined area that we're managing, basically everything south of Elliott is, is uh, upwards of 800,000 square kilometers and, you know, almost 40% of it was burnt this year. Uh, this is a little time series of the hot spots starting from the beginning of the year. So the first few bits were fires in, in January and then we had rain in uh, February and March before uh, things started picking up again, and you'll see uh, some more hot spots coming up uh, in this part of the world where there were some early fires uh, lit uh, in the Tennant Creek area, and, and uh, then control burning operations up in the, uh, the few areas around here, a fair bit in the West McDonald's here, and uh, considerable bits in the uh, south of New Yundamu in the Mount Doreen New Haven uh, area. And then uh, we're sort of getting into uh, May and June, July, August. We're probably into past August now. And then we start seeing some big runs out through uh, the Simpson. Uh, these are daily time steps so that uh, the, the hot spots just, you know, start filling up the landscape. And um, so that's the calendar year of 2011 from uh, up to, I think it's about the 11th of November. So uh, they don't represent all the, the burnt area uh, because there's uh, cloud affected in some areas, but it, it really gives a, a very good visual perspective of, of the uh, country that's uh, been burnt. I'm having trouble with the fact that that's changing at a different rate that this is here, so I'll have to keep twisting that way as opposed to being able to look this way. Uh, so back to back to the area that was was burnt, and and just a few quim, quick simple statistics of of areas burnt: uh, Northern Alice area, which is based on pastoral districts, uh, you know, a, a mix of pastoral and Aboriginal land and, and uh, reserve country. Uh, bits of, of sort of early burning happened and you know upwards of 35 percent of that uh, that region uh, burnt with with the big spike in August through October. Down south of Alice quite a different uh, situation. Uh, bits of fire that uh, were early uh, in the year not very much during the winter period and the, and the big spike in uh, September, which is largely coming from sort of the, uh, the edge of the Simpson region. The Plenty Highway, uh, or sorry, the Plenty region to the, to the northeast, uh, a big 
big spike in October and more than 50% of the country burnt uh, in that part of the world. Uh, much more diverse in Tennant Creek region, uh, lots more early fire. Part of it was, you know, active burning, um, some that was active um, prescribed burning that, that got a bit out of hand, but, uh, you know, it's the challenge of, of the, the type of season that we've had. You know, you're, you're burning with the best of intentions and they may go a little bit further, but, you know, ultimately a lot of this fire early in the season uh, was very advantageous to, to controlling many of the fires that happened uh, later in the year. Uh, but, you know, huge proportion of, of the, uh, the region burnt. And uh, the Barclay is, is one that's very different. Black soil country, big enterprises that can put out fires uh, really quickly. And when um, lightning strikes go across the Barclays, they, uh, they can mobilize resources uh, from the big corporations that, that are out there and uh, uh, the landscape as, as well as the value of the pasture and the enterprises help um, restrict the, uh, the country that gets burnt. When we sort of pop into the surrounding peripheral areas that are dominated by the Aboriginal land, uh, the Simpson, uh, big fires in September, October, mostly started by lightning, and uh, this is sort of an incomplete sort of story. Uh, the fires are still burning in, in the, down in that part of the world, or at least they were until this last bit of rain came through, and it's probably more than 50% uh, burnt in over there. Uh, Tanami, huge um, bit, of, bit of country burnt in September, uh, but considerable portions of country burnt early, and, and a lot of that was intentional management. The big challenge there is, is uh, doing enough of it. And in contrast, the southwest corner, much lower area burnt, and, uh, and it's, it's really quite different uh, down there this year than, than the big block of country through the middle. So just to uh, enhance that a little bit more, provide a bit more detail in sort of the patterns that happened through the year, uh, you know, we started with lightning and bushfires in, in uh, south of Allison in the edge of the Simpson. And uh, I have to do some foot ballet here, it says. Um, February rain, April, you know, we, we started the, the challenge of burning. And, and uh, you know, it was a big challenge. We knew what was coming. It was a matter of, you know, how much could we do uh, ahead of what we anticipated um, was going to be a big fire season. So just a, a quick look at the satellite images. The, they look much better on my screen than the projector is. But you know, this was a fire. Uh, lightning started fire down um, Alice Springs up here, the Old South Road on Deep Well. These others were uh, matches that started these fires. Um, they, they were sort of an indication of, of what was to come. They were, um, you know, in a relative sense, they didn't burn large country, area of country, but they were problematic to, to contain. And again, this is out the edge of the Simpson for people who know the, this is the Todd River coming down here and the hail over there. And lightning, one, two, three, four in a row, the three of them ended up coalescing uh, over the time period. So it, it really showed us that the, the fuel loads this year were gonna be uh, very, um, susceptible to, to lightning ignitions, which isn't always the case um, in years where the fuel loads are, are less continuous and uh, less dense. So one of the important programs that uh, was undertaken, which, you know, we, we knew we had to get more fire in the landscape and uh, a collaborative effort between parks and uh, through the Central Land Council with the uh, Hermanburg region and the Toowoomba Rangers was to do some aerial burning through the, the West McDonald's area. This is Ormiston Gorge for people who aren't familiar with the landscape from looking down on it. Uh, the Fink River coming down, heading towards Hermansburg here. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the squiggly lines are our are, are aerial burning runs on, on our first run, and we knew that we had to get fire in the landscape, 
and uh, we, we met with moderate success in the first run, so we, we did it again a month later, and the red bits that are sort of obvious are the burnt uh, patches that, that come up from the, the fire. The, the most important aspect of this was the collaboration between the land council and the park rangers, and also with Nawituma um, Station in the north. Um, you know, very much a supportive and coordinated program, both in terms of effort and energy and also money that was put into it. And, you know, the, the net result was, was a demonstration of, of you know, it, it's very much the way we need to manage that part of the landscape. Uh, you know, the, the parks have great fire management strategies and prescriptive burning. Uh, the challenge is getting out and doing it efficiently with um, the short time space that uh, we really have to work in in, in seasons like this. So um, the, the aerial work is, is really um, very important to the, uh, the process of efficiency and getting the job done. And it did um, help contain fires that did, <coughs> excuse me, come in from the north <coughs> later in the year. And most importantly as well was, was getting um, staff and volunteers engaged in the process and, and introducing them to, to using blowers and burners and, and uh, getting more, more country burnt and strategically and you know, improving the way that we can continually use fire in the landscape um, safely and efficiently. Another uh, very important area of aerial burning that was undertaken is in, in the Tanami, and that's um, working uh, in the Central Land Council as the, the driver, and uh, bushfires and myself provide um, you know, support and partnership and collaboration with it. So this is the North Tanami, Lajamanu sits up at the top here, and these lines here are aerial burning lines. The, the color coding is the, the NAFI fire map, so uh, the, the greenish patterns are our are, are early burning uh, program. And we've been doing it for, this is the third year of operation. We've, this year, most importantly, we've increased our engagement and collaboration with Supeljack, the pastoral property here, and specifically with the intention of, of burning along their eastern boundary. Uh, very successful in terms of getting a, a good burn here and this yellow patch of fire which came across and although it's shown as discontinuous is the same fire that, that came right across to the boundary and, and the, the, uh, the minimizing impact of, of this aerial burning was, was uh, very important and I think that you know, it, it highlights the, uh, the way that we're, we're learning and progressing uh, trying to manage this large piece of country and the relationships and the collaboration we're developing with, with the uh, uh, adjacent uh, land managers. So, very important program. And that's just the squiggles of, of uh, the aerial burning that we did in 2009, that same part of the world. So, the southern Tanami is another area of um, aerial burning that uh, the, the squiggles up the Lander River and out west of Wallara here. And uh, again, the green patterns are the early burns, the purple patterns, you know, sort of around and constrained by our early burning. Uh, there it's very much um, ecologically focused as much as, as anything else. There's a um, poor quality slide here in terms of this is Mulga country all through, scattered through the, the big extensive areas of, uh, of spin effects, but you know, our burning lines are specifically targeted to, to create patterns and patches that, that will provide um, uh, protection and to, to the mulga uh, in this part of the world to, to minimize the, uh, the uh, chance of large fires coming in from further afield and having big impacts on the mulga communities. Uh, Parks and land council aren't the only people that are, that are doing burning and aerial burning as well. Um, Sean Lee up at Murray Downs is just one example of pastoralists who, uh, who do a lot of burning and uh, you know, the, a lot of the early burning and the patterns in this 
uh, country from previous years are, are an active burning program, recognizing the, the need to, to burn early in the year and uh, many of the fires that uh, were being burnt were running into you know, water in uh, some of the, uh, the creeks and the drainage lines in, in that part of the world. And as we look later on into September, a lot of the fires were uh, constrained by the early, uh, earlier fires and made uh, response and, and minimizing the impact of those <coughs> later fires much you know, benefited muchly from the, uh, the earlier burning. So, and just sort of looking at some of the fires that you, you might have uh, been aware of, uh, this is Alice Springs here, and, and this was sort of one of the, the first big fire that was in the neighborhood of Alice Springs and contributed to a fair bit of smoke over the town and, and uh, the, the first ignition was along the Tanami Highway here, and we, for four or five days, we were working hard in, in containing it on the north side of the ranges here. Unfortunately, then the winds um, got around and we lost it into the hills, and that's when, uh, you know, we had to step up the sort of protection of, of Alice Springs and set up a, a, a much bigger program of, of operations. The second ignition uh, was out on the... Uh, Lara Pinta Drive in, in this part of the world. And so, you know, the, the, it was a big response. It, it really brought home to, to Alice Springs, uh, you know, the, the vulnerability of, of the, the region to fire. And, uh, you know, a lot of work was done to, to protect houses and infrastructure in the Wupataka area and all around the, the margins of the town. But, you know, once that had been done, the, the fire kept on going for another um, 10 days before it, it was eventually wrapped up out here at uh, Ellery Creek. And, you know, it was, it was a smoky fire that, you know, wasn't doing a lot of ecological damage to, to many parts of the landscape, but was very difficult to uh, contain. And, uh, but, you know, there was lots of patchiness to it. Um, the patterning is mostly the burnt country versus the unburnt country. <coughs> Clarity of the slides is poor, I apologize. Uh, but it, it highlighted that they were really continuous lines of fire and, and it, uh, they were difficult to, uh, to suppress. Um, but in the contrast between the impact of the fire and the mulga burnt on the left, there was very little mulga that um, you know, was, was killed by the fire. Uh, but the successful containment was on, on Hamilton Downs by burning a strip between two graded lines and, uh, and then bringing in lots of support from the Chewumpa Rangers, the Park Rangers, the Alice Springs Volunteers, the Pastoralists to, to all get together and get out there with helicopter assisted and with blowers and burners and rakos to actually get through the hard country and, and close off that fire. So, you know, one of the things that we thought of 10 years ago was, you know, fire gets in the hills, we, we leave it there till it comes out. We've picked up our skills and our confidence in, in, in getting out into the hills and, you know, strategically pinching it off. And, uh, you know, it was full credit to the team of people that went out there and, and worked so hard for a couple of days to, to, uh, to pull that fire up where they did. The second fire that, you know, is people are probably you know, aware of was the one south of Alice Springs. Uh, Alice Springs here, Hermansburg's just down over here. The fire started out near here and um, burnt over a period of, of three weeks all the way up to the outskirts of Alice Springs. And uh, you know, it, was, it was a series of, of missing a containment opportunity there, not quite getting a containment line finished there earlier. We lost it across the river there. We aim to protect, pull it up there, and, and it beat us to the highway. And you know, ultimately, you know, where it raced across the highway, it was it was blowing hot and hard, and you know, the it's really left part of the country very barren uh, from the impact of that fire. And this was, you know, in the middle of uh, August, not time, and not a time that you'd expect fire impacts to be so hard got up onto the, into the ranges of the waterhouse as well and burnt some very long unburnt acacia communities. 
and ultimately, you know, it was was contained, you know, on the on the the big major roads. And you can see the the brightness of here where the um, the fire really raced across the highway. So again, that was a a big containment operation that that brought in lots of collaboration and and uh, cooperation and and. Um, you know, was was a credit to everyone that was involved in in uh, the containment of that fire. And just to highlight, this is a grassland fire danger index. And so um, there was a bit of comment earlier in the year of you know all these fires around town and the fire danger index by the airport was still sitting at low. And you know, but for the most part, we we really had quite low, anything less than 20. Um, you know, isn't really a high fire danger. And the interesting thing was, this was the the first little bit of, of um, increase was was when the fire from the north came into town, and this was the second one where it belted across the uh, Stewart Highway south of town. And just as a little aside, the, the the couple of challenges that we've had this year have been with southwest winds, and Latsy's probably the one that. Uh, is, you know, warned me about um, southwest winds being a problem. And if you look at a windrose, Alice Springs hardly ever gets southwest winds, and usually it swings from the northwest to the southeast really quickly. But this is just <coughs> another example of there was some lightning strikes in uh, beginning of September in the Simpson, started a couple of fires, took off with a southeasterly up into uh, Namari Station in here. This one sort of just poked around for a little bit, stayed between the dunes, hardly did anything for days. Namari sort of wrapped up the fire. Their program was, was really well set up. They had containment blocks and, and uh, everything was prepared. It worked. And, but the fire kept on poking around for down in the desert. And then we got a southwest wind, came, blew it off this side, blew this one out and then followed up by the southeasterlies that um, oops Sticky fingers, I pushed the wrong button. Now this, now this is moving, and that one's not. Yeah, is it an animation in the next page? Is that? Um, that's that's the animation. So it really needs to run all the way down to the bottom of it, which yeah. is down somewhere about here. Which page are we on? No, way down. That's all I did with John's was poke around. It magically resumed. Maybe that'll do. Oh, yeah. Right. So there, the south southwest winds pushed it out. The southeasterlies drove it up, and it was this big run here that that overwhelmed um, Nummery, and uh, you know all their containment and and preparations were were just. Um, beyond you know sort of being able to uh, to stop the fire uh, they did a lot of good work to to re minimize the impact the, you know the fires continue to run for and it's still you know two months later we're still burning the net result was that um, large portions of of the uh, the paddocks that's area burnt uh, and percentage burnt the big number here down in the corner 70 percent of the property was um, was burnt by um, and that uh, <laughs> You know, a real challenge to continuing to, you know, the viability of the property. And when you look at sort of the uh, the country burnt just in the Alice Springs bushfire region, uh, you know, there's two dozen properties that have had more than 50 percent of their their country burnt, you know, in 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 this season alone, and you know, very few of them have not been affected by fire. Um, Another interesting fire was the, the one that went through the Mulga. Um, this is the Jindalee over the horizon radar. Fires had been around it for the previous um, month or two. Uh, they were aware of, of the, uh, the risks. I apologize that they, it's so poor to see, but the fire did belt down from the north. Um, 
the, the huge um, fires um, running through the canopy of, of the Malga. Uh, they evacuated the site. The, the, the array was damaged, but, but not the facilities. Uh, you know, it was just consuming um, trees. You can see half of Malga trees here and uh, stripped right down. So, uh, um, you know, an indication of the hot, intense fires that, that can happen, and, and this was, you know, only in September. Another big extensive fire was, was in the Wakaya Desert, but El Kidra and Nidawa had done some early burning. They, had, they were a bit concerned that this fire that they lit that burnt for six weeks poking around up here was going to be a problem for them. It ended up being, you know, very beneficial. A, uh, a fire started over here, burnt up the Barclay Highway, and then turned around, and, and that's about a 40-kilometer fire front um, belting down uh, through there, probably one of the, the more intense fires that uh, we've captured on the satellite this year. And fortunately for them, this small trickly patchy burn was, was what pulled it up and, and you know, really protected the majority of their um, property. Um, so the, the big challenge that we, we did have in dealing with all these fires was the number of fires that was happening all at the same time. And, and there's just this quick grab of three days of hot spots showing that there was fires to the south of Alice down in a variety of properties. The desert was still burning. Ruby Gap was burning. Yamba, Hamilton Downs was burning. Uh, Manners, Marqua, Jervois, Indiana, Pine Creek. Tea tree, uh, all up through Amaru, you know, the, lots of fires all happening at the same time and, and making it really difficult for both bushfires to provide support uh, on the ground, but also challenging the, the capacity of, of neighbors to help each other as well because, you know, lots of the fire containment and suppression work is done with help from your neighbors and if they're fighting their own fire, you know, it makes it much more difficult to uh, to uh, deal with the situation. So uh, quickly, sort of having looked at what, the, what has happened, I thought it was important to, to sort of provide a, a brief reminder of, of um, what the main drivers of fire in Central Australia are. And it was sort of prompted by the uh, climate change forum that they had in Alice Springs a couple of weeks ago. And uh, I'll talk a bit more about uh, climate change further on, but <coughs> very simple system. It rains, it grows grass, it dries out, and it burns. But, uh, you know, as has already been mentioned, variability is the key in central Australia. So when we have big rains, we get lots of fires, and when we have less rain, we get very little fire. And so what that means is that above average, you know, from a big fire perspective is... 24 months of above average rainfall. It's not just a single single event. It's you know multiple or more um, cumulative rainfall effects that that create the opportunities uh, for these big seasons that we're experiencing. But nonetheless, it's important to recognise that you know there's always an important opportunity to burn in Central Australia. And you know there, there's the main fuel types and and. Uh, their distribution across the landscape is moderately well known. And the big change that happens, you know, in big years is that they go from patchy to being continuous, and that's what creates the, the big issue of, of uh, managing fuels and fires in Central Australia is when we have these big continuous fuel loads. So, but the key to understanding it all is that, you know, it's, it's a huge area. We're, you know, we sort of live in... Um, think Alice Springs is sort of, you know, representative of, of Central Australia in many ways. It's, you know, the longest rainfall record. It's where the most people live and sort of view the landscape from. Uh, but it's incredibly diverse. And, you know, a patch of spin effects over here isn't the same as that spin effects or that spin effects or that spin effects. So we have to add that complexity into it. And it's, you know, hugely variable. And... But most importantly, you know, recognizing that fire is such an important part of the landscape and that, you know, the, the concepts of patch burning, which people, 
quickly throw around, oh yes, patch burning saved this, or we're going to go out and do some patch burning. It's, it's really important that we all start learning more about what patch burning is and um, you know, wh what value it has in, in the big landscape. And you know, it's really about putting fire diversity into the landscape. Uh, and it has benefits during these big seasons, but it, it isn't going to always save you. And that's where the style, the scale, and the, the intensity of, of the burning that you do, whether it, it really needs to change and you know, containment, compartmentalization, <coughs> excuse me, with linear strips and linking patches is so important, and and that you can't do this easily in these big years unless you've been doing all the hard work in the years before that of putting patches in the landscape and being active and burning and and knowing the landscape, <coughs> and then in the context of everything that's driving it, whether. You know, the economic side of things, you, the, the pastoral properties that rely on the grass to, to keep them going, the ecological side of things that's, you know, uh, hugely important in the, uh, the, the park and reserve network and, and the uh, Aboriginal land and the cultural features of, uh, that, that fit across all the, the aspects of, of the land become very important. And, and the importance of time as well because, you know, the, there's a uh, understanding how long a patch and the fuel loads that uh, you know will be beneficial to you uh, through time is very important. And this is just an example of, of sort of the, the contrasting sort of information we have of the Northern Tanami IPA. It's you know mapped from a Western perspective of you know a few areas of biologically you know on the long drainage lines, but essentially it's a big sheet of sand. But when you look at the culture significance, there's a, a much more detailed knowledge of sites and, and that we have to, to bring this into our fire management programs as well so that we're not managing just for you know, a few isolated <coughs> pockets of, of um, biological significance. We, we integrate the whole cultural program together. So that's sort of continuing with one of the themes that I was going to was, was looking back at, at what has happened in the past. And it's, it's very difficult to sort of look back to the last, uh, the, the big episode of fires in the, um, in the 70s. I'm only a new chum here. I arrived in 82 so that I missed this opportunity. There's people that are here that, uh, you know, remember it uh, and experienced it. But th this is a, the best I could do 20 years ago at sort of mapping uh, the country that was affected by fire in the 70s and it was, you know, the satellite technology wasn't there. We couldn't do as, as good a job as we can now. So it's, it's very incomplete, but, you know, the, the records are that there was lots of fire through the whole decade of the 70s. It wasn't just a few years, wet years. It was, it was almost a decade of, of uh, above average rainfall. And the early 80s were, was still wet, and that was when we, uh, you know, lots of the western desert country burnt, and we were doing lots of, of research and improving our understanding of fire and spin effects. Uh, through the, the mid to late 80s, there was uh, quite a bit of fire uh, scattered around. Not much, a bit more in the early 90s, not much in the late 90s, and then the big 2000 event where... You know, that, that was three years, and, and again, it was one year after another after another, and, and that, uh, you know, we learned a lot from it. Um, and, you know, most importantly, there was this thought that, oh, we're on a 30-year <laughs> rainfall cycle, and this is Alice Springs, and, and again, it's not always representative of all of Central Australia, but it's the only long-term station that we've got. Lots of ups and downs in it, and, you know, that's the average or... Uh, going across there. And if we look at when, you know, there were periods of, of two years of above average rainfall, you know, th they're not at 30 year intervals at all. And uh, despite the fact that, you know, there's 20s to 50s to 70s to 2000, that th there is cycles there. But what we have to do is remember the variability of, of the landscape and and that we have to manage for the variability within it. So if we look at Curtin Springs and Rabbit Flat, 
as alternative views of, of the, uh, the patterns of, fire, of rainfall and above average. You know, the Curtin Springs in the early, sort of the late 80s, very much, you know, a few years of above average rainfall and lots of fire in that part of the world. Then the uh, Rabbit Flat Tanami area in the mid 90s, everyone got it in the <coughs> 2000s. And again, um, this was Rabbit Flat Tanami in 2007. So, you know, this was again big fires. This is the 89 period in using Curtin Springs as a representation of, of a big fire season and, and opportunities to, to burn and, and risk to resources and assets. The, the mid 90s one up, up there. Um, and then this is the 2007 one. So, again, two years of cumulative rainfall. Look where all the, uh, the country is sitting down here. It's just an average year in Alice Springs. And that was the country that was, that was burnt at that time. So, a huge big fire in 2007. Strategically very important for getting a lot of the programs happening in the, in the Tanami over the next few years. And, uh, you know, a, a big impact. But important to remember that small fires also have significant impacts, and, and it was this small fire that wiped out the, contributed to the demise of the mall in the, in, the, uh, in the wild in the early 90s. So what was also the difference between the 2001-2 period with uh, this, this last year? Well, it was, the, the patterning of fire was, in uh, 2001, fairly you know distributed through the year, um, 230 square kilometers burnt. The majority of it was north of Alice Springs uh, in in that period. The following year, almost 200,000 burnt, but the majority of it had shifted down to to south of Alice Springs. Very little country uh, burnt, you know, from one year to the next. Um, so, and if we use the, the drought index as a, uh, a nice sort of, to help us understand the information, dry is at the top, wet is at the bottom. So um, the, we started off in 99 as, as being dry. We had 2000, 2001, 2002, the summers were, were good wet summers. It never really dried out for those couple of years. And, uh, and the 2001 fires were, were sort of as it dried out, but then they were put out by uh, subsequent rainfall. Whereas the 2002 fires were um, when it was much drier, a little bit of rain to put it out, and then the continuation of, of, the, uh, of the dry conditions. And so there's quite a dramatic contrast between the impact of those 2001 fires compared to 2002, especially in some of the pastoral enterprises. And there's two pastoralists here that uh, one had a 2001 fire and uh, pats himself on the back, and the other one had a 2002 fire and struggled for years. So, you know, it's that, that whole thing of, of a bit of luck in terms of when fires happen and, and uh, when you get the rainfall. In contrast, this year, uh, you know, almost the whole area that um, of the previous two years burnt in, in, burnt in a single event, and uh, you know, we're almost at 40 percent of the region burnt. Uh, but when we look at the, the difference in the drought index, uh, we had we didn't have a dry winter last year. We we had our two seasons just flowed on one after another, and that's also what's contributed to the growth and the, the difficulty that we've had in, in uh, burning. The, the whole system was really wet, and you know this is where we are at the moment, majority of fires here. So what's happening? Is this going to come back down again, or is it if it's going to dry out? Looking out the window, it's more than likely going to come back down here, which is all very good. Um, I think I'm going to skip the little bit of the Simpson. It's big buyers in the 70s again in 2001 and again in 2011. So um, without dwelling on it, it's, it's been an impact, um, a, a big area that um, our intentions of, of knowing that it was an area that we needed to get out and burn 
and, and manage better. We haven't uh, been able to achieve that and, and you know, the potential ecological impacts as well as health issues associated with dust and everything that's going to come onto those areas in the next little while, depending on this rain, of course, um, you know, is going to be very real. So what, what really did we learn? You know, we, we've learned to, to use information from a whole variety of sources. It's not just rainfall, it's pasture growth models from, from Aussie grass. And this highlights the fact that you know, we went from April last year, it didn't dry out in October and just kept getting bigger. When we sort of looked at what the change was, it sort of highlighted that there was this northwest south east pattern, quite different in the southwest um, region, and uh, that was really driven by differences in rainfall as well as temperature. And when we look at the, uh, the pattern of where the big fuel loads were and where the fires were, it's um, pretty obvious there's a high correlation there. And these are a few slides taken from a presentation that I did with Gina Brune um, last year about the, the work that we've done together on a lot focused in the Tanami about you know, how we're improving the collaboration and understanding of and involvement in fire management in those parts of the world. The Desert Fire Project was, was hugely significant in, in bringing people to work together, establishing a collaboration that that's, um, still exists and is building on today significant in getting a fire management officer working in the CLC and uh, the, the spin-offs associated with the, the IPAs and the, the money and the resources brings uh, to it is very important. Um, and the Aboriginal Ranger programs, vastly important to, to getting more capacity out there and uh, you know, covering large portions of the uh, the region as well as uh, providing fantastic support this year during many of the fire events. And so another important thing is that the Waterloo Committee, the, the regional committee modeled on the, uh, the bushfires uh, uh, council uh, approach where senior people uh, from the whole region of, of responsibility get together and plan and, and provide input and direction to the management of that huge block of country. And uh, there's considerable interest in, in uh, replicating that in the, in the southwest going, uh, and it'll be a cross-border cross program in the southwest where it'll extend into West Australia and South Australia through the, uh, the APY lands. And again, pulling together much more engagement and capacity into managing those, that country. Parks, as I said earlier, big advances in, in you know, being able to, to have great strategies. We have a great fire management uh, program and the, the challenge is always getting the work done in the time period and, and the balancing of the trade-offs of, of looking after visitors and and uh, getting the fires out in, in the uh, program and dealing with the neighbors and uh, the more collaborative projects like we had this year, you know, the, the, the really beneficial gains that we'll get in, in improving the management of, of that country. And, you know, great pictures and using blowers and burners. And so, you know, increasing our capacity is, you know, we know how to do it. We know how that we need to all understand you know, what are the seasonal triggers of fire. We, we can make sure that we, we improve people's skills and understanding and more collaboration. And the big challenge is, is this variability. You know, in a year like this, you couldn't throw enough money at, <coughs> at, at doing things because you needed so many resources in a short space of time. And uh, so, you know, the, the challenge is, is how to, uh, you know, put our understanding together and, and you know, create effective programs when, when we have these big events uh, across such a big landscape. But, you know, we have to take some heart. This is what, this, this is Arnhem Land and the success of their burning program up there 10 years ago or a bit more. You know, they flew a couple of aerial burn lines, much like we do in the Tanami these days. 
10 years later with a big input of funds and resources and people, you know, it's like spaghetti out there now. And, and that's what's making a change. It's, it's getting a lot more people engaged and involved and, you know, they've sorted out the funding issues. We've got to, you know, look for opportunities and ways of, of doing the same thing on, you know, the landscapes. The thing to remember is that the, uh, you know, one small corner, the Tanami, the uh, northern Tanami IPA is still 50% bigger than, than this region here. So the challenges are very real. So quickly before, don't want to, if I talk too long, I don't get questions, so that's good. Um, <laughs> what's happening this year? Uh, we're still in a La Nina phase, which is um, weaker than it was last year, but uh, the forecasts are that uh, we're going to have um, an expectation of exceeding median rainfall this year through much of the territory, um, and that's the prediction up till January. There will be a new one out um, next week to, to push us through till February. So the, the prospects are good that we'll get rain, which will help a lot of the pasture and the grass recover. Whether we um, will get sufficient rain to, to um, have fires reburn again in areas that will burnt, it's going to be very much dependent on the patterning of the rainfall and the landscape, of course, which I can't emphasize more. And again, highlighting, this is an area of the Simpson that was burnt in January, and this not all that clear country, but you know, why did this country burn again? The, uh, <coughs> the lightning strike down here south of Numeri uh, blew up through here, and it implied in the first few days it wasn't going to go through that country, uh, but it did, and it broke up, uh, but there was still sufficient growth to, to get the fire through there. So an eight-month interval, uh, pretty unusual in Central Australia. But, you know, we can look at the drought index to help us understand why. We had had huge amounts of soil moisture uh, and growth, a small little dry period here when the first fire happened, followed by more rain, so the grasses just recovered straight away, and they didn't burn until, you know, they were much drier up here. So the chances, you know, it, it depends on where this purple line goes over the next few months as to, to uh, you know, what situation we're going to be in for next year. But having said that, there's still large areas in, around Alice Springs that haven't been burnt yet. We've got the southwest corner of the territory, which... I expected wouldn't burn this year, but they've had the most rainfall so far this season already, and they're shifting from that intermediate state of recovery into the into the higher fuel loads uh, with this rain that's going to put it on. So, um, you know, the the expectation of you know fire in in the south is is next year is is increasing significantly, and you know there's still lots of patches in the middle that uh, can be filled in with, with fires that will be quite problematic. You can't talk about what's going to happen next year without mentioning buffalo grass, of course, but I won't dwell on it. <laughs> so I'm sure there'll be questions. <laughs> climate change, um, again from the Climate Forum, the forecast is for increasing temperatures and evaporation and variable rainfall. This is a report that came out. Um, Hennessy did it in 2007. So the patterning is for the territory, it's going to get hotter a little bit in the short term, a lot in the future. The, they really don't know what's happening with the rainfall. Um, you know, they're sort of saying, well, it'll be plus or minus zero change, plus or minus a little bit or a lot. And, um, but it's going to get hotter and the evaporation is going to change you know, considerably. So a report that came out of Queensland, which was much along the line of what was reported at the Climate Change Forum the other day, is there'll be declining pasture quality due to decreased evaporation. And then they contradict themselves and say there's going to be you know, more bushfires. We need to make sure that more people understand the drivers of Central Australia and that, you know, higher temperatures and more variable rainfall is not going to meet more bushfires. But having said that, variability is what this is all about. So 
we still have to manage for variability and we still need to just respond to the season. Whether climate changes or not, or the, the rate at which it changes, it's still going to be a variable place and our management and responsibilities of fire management have to be responding to, to that variability. Fire is very much a part of the ecosystem. We need to do it every year and you know, we all need to improve our understanding of it. Thank you.